many lectures on the web. You use it much? You find it useful? Find it something that you can send you to sleep if you've got insomnia? So we'll continue to put them on in that case if they're useful. Okay. Well, today we're going to take a little bit of a different tack in our discussion of viruses. And we're going to talk for three lectures about viruses that can cause tumors and also HIV AIDS. And there are only two PowerPoint presentations for the three lectures. And at some stage uh, in tomorrow's lecture, if I don't get through all the tumor virus stuff today, then you'll have to switch over to the other PowerPoint. But we're continuing on our talk about viruses. And you heard quite a bit about viruses now. Most viruses have a pretty simple aim in life, which is like most other organisms, to produce more viruses. And so they replicate. Very often they will lyse the cell, and out of the cell will come new viruses, which can go on and infect new cells to make more viruses. So this is called the lytic life cycle, and to make a new virus, you need to express all of the viral proteins in order to make, the viral, uh, to make a new virus, the structural proteins, and also those proteins that are necessary to control the production of structural proteins and replication of the viral genome. However, there are certain viruses that exhibit a different kind of lifestyle. And these are often referred to as the tumor viruses. And in this case, the virus gets into the cell, but it does not produce new versions of the virus, even though it may well be capable of producing new versions of the virus. And instead, it integrates usually its nucleic acid into the host chromosomes where it can reside for an indefinite amount of time. Now, later on, if that is a whole virus, it can, under changed circumstances, produce new virions and lies the cell, get out of the cell. Or, by taking up residence within the cell, it can transform the cell. It can alter the properties of the host cell. Now, as I said, sometimes that latency may terminate and the produce new viruses. But in that case, the whole virus must be there in order to make a whole virus, progeny virus. Now, during the process of transformation, during this, lytic, oh, sorry, this uh, latent lifestyle, some virus proteins get expressed. And these, in many cases, are the early functions. These are the functions that the virus uses to turn on the synthesis of nucleic acid to inside the host cell in order that it may replicate its own genome. There are control proteins you've heard about early and late proteins in viruses. The early ones are the control proteins which change the uh, environment inside the cell to the advantage of the infecting virus. The late ones tend to be the proteins that will form the true progeny viruses. So during transformation, you're not making any viruses, and therefore the structural proteins of the virus are not expressed, but many of the early functions are. And these change the properties of the host cell to transform it. And very often, since these are proteins that change the nucleic acid metabolism of the cell, what you see is loss of growth control. And if these cells are things like epithelial cells, and most, if not many, many if not most tumors are tumors of epithelial cells, they will exhibit changes in their cell surface proteins, which will allow the cell to become less adhesive to its surrounding cells. The cell becomes more motile. It can invade other tissues and have all the properties that you expect of a transformed cell. And of course, what we see in the patient is its ability to form tumors um, in which viral genes interfere with the control of cellular replication. And very often we also see that the integration of the virus, the residence of the virus within the host cell causes changes in the chromosomes. And that can be just um, aberrations, which I'll talk to you about a little later on, breaking up of the chromosomes at certain places. So then we can define what viral transformation is. It's the changes in the biological functions of a cell that result from the regulation of the cell's metabolism by viral genes and confer upon the host cell the properties of neoplasia. 
And both RNA and DNA tumor viruses can do this. Very often, the genome of the virus gets integrated into host cell chromosomes, usually randomly in the host cell. And although the biology of RNA viruses and DNA viruses are somewhat different, the way in which they cause transformation of the cell can often be very, very similar. So the two classes then we have of the tumor viruses are the DNA tumor viruses, and as their name implies, they have a DNA genome, and that DNA genome has to be copied many times over to form more DNA genomes, and that can be done either by a host-dependent, uh, a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which may come from the host, or may be provided by the virus itself. Now, just like our cells, we also have to make proteins of the virus. That means making messenger RNA, and that is always done by the host mRNA polymerase, the ones that you and I use to make our messenger RNA so that it can be translated into protein. Now, in contrast to this, are the RNA tumor viruses, otherwise known as the retroviruses. And as their name implies, they have an RNA genome, and yet they have to integrate into the chromosomes of the host cell. Now, the chromosomes of the host cell are made of DNA, and so the first step that the virus has to uh, take is to turn its RNA genome, which it carries within the viral particle, into DNA, in order to integrate it, and that is something that normal cells don't do. We don't normally copy RNA to DNA, we copy DNA to RNA, and in order to carry out this process of changing its RNA genome into a DNA version of the genome, the virus has to provide an enzyme to do that, and it does do that, and it, it uh, provides an enzyme that is diagnostic of the retroviruses, and that is reverse transcriptase. Now, the DNA integrates into the chromosomes, and it is just like any other gene inside the cell inside the chromosomes. And that gene can be copied as the cell uh, divides, mitosis. The chromosomes are copied, and it is copied by a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase as the um, cell divides itself. But when you want to make more genomic RNA, there's a DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and that is the host polymerase too. That is the enzyme that you and I normally use to make messenger RNA. And that's rather important for the biology of these viruses. They're using a host RNA polymerase that is normally used to make messenger RNA to copy their own genomes. And if you probably remember from Biochemistry 101, kindergarten biochemistry, that the RNA polymerases do not have a proofreading function, and that is of enormous consequence to the biology of these viruses because they are extremely good at mutating and that causes a lot of problems in production of vaccines and we'll see that particularly when we come to talk about the virus that causes uh, AIDS, HIV. So you've got the DNA version in the integrated into the chromosomes. That is now copied by the host RNA polymerase 2 into viral genomic RNA and from that viral genomic RNA we've got messenger RNA coming off and that is translated to viral protein. So it's very important to remember that this is using a host RNA polymerase to make its genome and an enzyme that is normally use, used by us in an uninfected cell to make our messenger RNA. So let's then look at these two classes of uh, tumor virus in more detail. And what we're going to do is look at the DNA tumor viruses and just list some of the DNA viruses that can cause tumors. And then we're going to look at the RNA tumor virus and how they cause tumors. And then we'll come back to the DNA tumor viruses because it was the discovery of how RNA tumor viruses cause cancer that then allowed us to elucidate how DNA viruses do the job. So here are the DNA tumor viruses. DNA genome make uh, messenger RNAs, which are translated into protein. So they're protein production mechanisms are the same as we have in our normal uninfected cells, or they can integrate, usually they integrate, but sometimes they can be there as episomes, but they can integrate into the chromosomes and cause transformation, and I've already said it's the early functions that get um, expressed. Now, some of these DNA tumor viruses, probably the most 
Important DNA tumor viruses are the papillomaviruses. For a long time, it's been known that these can cause natural cancers in animals. They also cause warts. If you've ever had warts, then they're caused by papillomaviruses. They're everywhere in the environment. Most people get a papillomavirus infection. They go for the epithelial cells, as you might expect, for something that causes warts. Um, and so most tumor tumors are, in fact, malignancies of epithelial cells. And it was known quite a long time ago that there was one disease which caused warts, which is called Epiderma dysplasia verusiformis. And in these warts, you can get transformation to a malignant squamous cell carcinoma. And here's a picture of Epiderma dysplasia verusiformis. But papillomaviruses have been implicated in much more common, in fact, very common, uh, tumors in urogenital cancer in which a wart may um, transform into a malignant cell. And papillomaviruses were originally implicated in uh, cervical cancer on epidemiological grounds, but now we have far better evidence to suggest very strongly that papillomaviruses are indeed the causative agents of cervical cancer. And probably other histologically similar cancers are caused by papillomaviruses, including those of the esophagus, lung, and larynx. In fact, people have estimated that maybe 10% of human cancers are caused by papillomaviruses. Now, there are lots of types of papillomaviruses, and many of us in this room will have been infected by certain types of papillomaviruses. Last time I looked, there were about 50 of these things, and the most common, causing warts, etc., are types 6 and 11. But most people clearly don't go down with a papilloma-caused tumor, and most cervical vulvar and penile cancers are associated with rarer forms of the papillomaviruses, particularly type 16 and 18. And 70% of penile cancers are associated indeed with these two types of papillomavirus. So these are epidemiological studies looking at correlations between infection of tissue, infection of biopsy specimens, and uh, the presence of the virus. But nevertheless, it's quite clear that these particular um, papillomaviruses, 16 and 18, transform human keratinocytes, which is what you might expect. And now we can, we've got an extremely effective vaccine that's just come out. It's called Gardasil, and it's a quadrivalent recombinant vaccine. These are proteins made in uh, yeasts, um, and they contain proteins from types 6, 11, 16, and 18, and it's, it's an extremely effective vaccine. So it looks pretty clear that papillomaviruses indeed do um, are responsible for things like uh, cervical cancer. Polyomaviruses, you've heard a little bit about polyomaviruses. The archetypal polyomaviruses was SV40. Many people of Dr. Mayer's age have received SV40 because it was a contaminant in the very early strains of the salt polio vaccine. Um, so the people were, that was because the, the salt polio vaccine was and still is made on monkey kidney cells. And so the cells that were originally used were contaminated by this polyomavirus SV40. And there's no evidence that SV40 has caused um, tumors in people as a result of that. However, if you're a juvenile hamster, then it's a cause uh, of sarcomas in juvenile hamsters. Uh, the mouse polyomavirus will cause leukemia in mice. There are two human polyomaviruses. We just mentioned this, by the way, normally. But in fact, um, there is, from last year now, a possible association of the uh, human polyomavirus known as BK. BK was the initial of the patient from whom it was uh, isolated. And there's been this association in one study. It made the newspapers about six months ago. Even the state newspaper carried it. So it must have been somewhat important, I suppose. On the other hand, knowing what the state newspaper carries, then maybe it wasn't of any importance. Anyway, there is this association between BK virus, a human virus, and, and prostate cancer in men um, in one study. So we'll, time will tell whether the correlation actually pans out. But these polyomaviruses are able to transform cells when they've got an incomplete genome. So that means that when they normally go into cells, if they're complete, they will cause a lytic infection and produce more polyomaviruses. But if they've got only part of their genome, the early part of the genome, then they can transform cells. So these early functions that are being examined, uh, that are being expressed here, are what we call oncogenes. These are genetic material that will cause tumors. 
Also, in parentheses here, JC, the other human virus here, has been strongly associated with PML, and you'll hear more about that, I think, under the slow virus lecture later on uh, next week. And PML was a very rare disease, but is becoming increasingly common, and you'll almost certainly see it when you get into the clinics in patients with an HIV infection. Adenoviruses, very oncogenic in animals. Only part of the virus gets integrated in this case. And as you might expect from what I've been saying so far, it's those early functions again. The functions that allow the cell, the virus, to usurp the DNA synthetic functions of the, um, of the host cell. And these are known as the E1A and the E1B. So these parts of the virus here are known as the virus, the adenovirus oncogene. So we can now def uh, define an oncogene. It's a gene that codes for a protein that can potentially transform a normal cell into a malignant cell. An oncogene can be transmitted by a virus, and then we call it a viral oncogene. A little bit different are the herpes viruses. The very first human tumor virus was a herpes virus. You know, the very first human tumor virus to be discovered was a uh, herpes virus. There's a lot of evidence that they're involved in several human cancers. Some are extremely tumorigenic. They are found integrated into the DNA of tumor cells, but in a minority very often of the tumor cells in, um, or the cells in a tumor, and there's been this idea that they've had sort of a hit and run mechanism of producing cellular transformation. The very first virus to be discovered as a human tumor virus was Epstein-Barr virus. And this is a strange virus because it has a different effect according to where you live. It was discovered by Dennis Burkett, who was a physician in Africa, and he noticed, um, or sorry, it wasn't, he discovered a lymphoma called uh, Burkitt's lymphoma, and it was later discovered, it wasn't actually discovered, the virus wasn't discovered by Burkitt, with the, but the causative agent of Burkitt's lymphoma was uh, discovered to be Epstein-Barr virus. And there are two forms of the um, of Burkitt's lymphoma, endemic and non-endemic. The common one throughout the tropical belt is the endemic form, and that has been associated with malaria as a cofactor. And it seems that if you are debilitated by having a malarial infection, then the virus, and everybody virtually in tropical regions is infected by EBV in the very early years of life. So everybody's infected by it. But when you get a debilitating disease like malaria, then the virus can express itself, and um, then you get a proliferation of the cells in which the virus is resting, is living, and those are the B lymphocytes, and you get Burkitt's lymphoma. The non-endemic is what you find outside the tropical belt, and in fact, you can get, there are sporadic cases all over the world of non-endemic Burkitt's lymphoma, not as strongly correlated in certain regions, particularly in North America with Epstein-Barr virus, um, but nevertheless, there is a, a correlation between non-endemic and Epstein-Barr virus, but there's a very strong correlation in the endemic tropical belt associated Burkitt's lymphoma. Here's a child with Burkitt's lymphoma up here. Now, this is... The Burkitt's lymphoma, the endemic form, is found in the tropical regions of Africa, the Caribbean, and also places like New Guinea. We think malaria is associated with this because that is, those are the regions where you get malaria. And in places like New Guinea, where there have been very extensive eradication campaigns for mosquitoes, as a result, the incidence of malaria has gone down. The incidence of Burkitt lymphoma has also gone down. Now, if you are in Southeast Asia and you're infected very early in life um, by Epstein-Barr virus, the more likely carcin uh, uh, um, cancer that you'll get is nasal pharyngeal cancer, nasal pharyngeal car carcinoma. And we don't know why that in these areas the predominant Carcinoma is this one. It could be something to do with the diet, eating smoked fish. It could be something to do with the genetics of that population, um, different HLA antigens, etc. But nasopharyngeal cancer is the, in Taiwan, is the most common cancer in men and the third most common cancer in women. And that is caused by Epstein-Barr virus. Now, in Western countries, most people do not get infected 
as, as early on in, uh, by Epstein-Barr virus. But if you do get infected later on in life in your adolescence, then in some cases you will get infectious mononucleosis, otherwise known as glandular fever. Another proliferation, but this time not a um, transformation of the cells, but another proliferation of the B lymphocytes. So you don't see glandular fever in uh, underdeveloped countries because everybody has gotten a subclinical dose of the virus, or at least has had a subclinical infection by EBV very early in life. We see glandular fever, infectious mono, in Western countries because many people don't get that um, infection early in life. When you get it in your adolescence, it will give you infectious mononucleosis. Now, another of these herpes viruses that has raised its ugly head in the AIDS epidemic is Kaposi's sarcoma herpes virus, human herpes virus 8. And Dave Ganjemi, I'm sure, told you a little bit about that. It is the causative agent of a... Um, malignancy of endothelial cells and uh, causes, as I said, Kaposi's sarcoma. That was a very benign or rather benign indolent um, uh, sarcoma that was uh, around in a very small number of people prior to the AIDS epidemic. A very virulent form um, has now been associated with HIV-infected people. But either way, it appears they're caused by human herpes virus 8. It's also the cause of other uh, malignancies, uh, hematologic malignancies. Um, multicentric Castleman's disease is also associated with HIV, um, and that you, in that you get swelling of the lymph nodes all over the body. That's why it's called multicentric Castleman or multicentric disease. Um, and various other lymphoproliferative disorders seem to be the result of the infection of the patient by, um, H, uh, by human herpes virus 8, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. Now, not everybody goes down with a malignancy when they're infected by this, and not everybody goes down with a malignancy when they're infected by EBV, as we well know. So there are other factors that come in together, probably partially immune suppression, that allows the uh, virus then to cause its trans transforming effect. Somewhat different from the viruses that I've talked about so far, these DNA viruses that have a DNA genome that just um, gets replicated along with the chromosomes, is hepatitis B virus. This has a, a DNA genome in the virus, but it doesn't just copy that DNA genome into DNA by using a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. It actually copies that DNA genome into more DNA genome via an RNA form, and that copying of the RNA provirus into the DNA genome requires an enzyme that's very similar to the one we see in retroviruses, i.e. reverse transcriptase. And that, of course, has to be provided by the virus, which it is. You heard more, quite a lot, I'm sure, in the hepatitis lectures about hepatitis V. Vast public health problem. Um, a large proportion of people in underdeveloped countries are chronic carriers. It's latent for a long time in cells. And there's a strong correlation between uh, HBV and hepatocellular carcinoma. There are a huge number of cases in East Asia of hepatocellular carcinoma every year, and your relative risk is hundredsfold higher if you are um, H hepatitis B positive. And there's an example of hepatitis B caused hepatocellular carcinoma. So to summarize... So far, about our friends, the DNA tumor viruses, they can have two lifestyles. They can be lytic and produce new virus. Or they can go to ground in the cell's genome and they can have a transforming lifestyle, a latent lifestyle in which they exist and replicate along with the cell but don't produce progeny viruses. And then in that case, the only genes that are expressed are the genes that are not those genes for the structural proteins, but the genes for changing the, the nucleic acid metabolism of the host cell. Now, one thing to note is, of course, these early functions, and I'm saying this because we want to contrast this with the retroviruses, these early functions are the oncogenes, as I've already said, but they are necessary for the production of a new virus particle, for a productive infection. So these early genes can cause transformation, but in order for the cell to produce new viruses, 
They, these genes have to be switched on to control DNA metabolism in the cell, and so they are necessary for a productive infection. That's in contrast to the oncogenes that we'll be seeing in the retroviruses. So those are a few of the more important DNA tumor viruses that are known to cause neoplasms in humans. We know that something is special about those early genes that allows the cell to be transformed. But exactly how that, goes, that happens had to wait until we understood how the RNA tumor viruses cause cancers. So let's now go on and look at the RNA tumor virus. These are much less spectacular looking viruses compared to some of the beautiful viruses that, you, um, that are DNA tumor viruses, things like the adenovirus. I mean, they're just absolutely herpes virus. They're gorgeous looking things in an electron microscope. These are not particularly good looking viruses. Um, they have, as I said, a RNA genome copied to DNA by reverse transcriptase. That genome now has to get into a chromosome. So the virus also codes for an enzyme called the integrase. Now, these are important virus-encoded enzymes, and they're of great importance because they are the enzymes that we can target for the Achilles heel of the virus, because this is doing something that we don't normally need to do. We don't need to copy RNA into DNA. We don't need to copy bits of... of uh, we don't need to take bits of DNA and stick them in our chromosomes. The virus does. And so it gives us an avenue of antiviral chemotherapy. And I'll talk to you about that uh, later on in the week. But these are virus-encoded enzymes, reverse transcriptase, integrase, and then there is this host-encoded enzyme that we use to make our messenger RNA, RNA polymerase 2. And you can see here, there's a budding... They, these are all membrane-bound, here it is budding out of the cell, and here is the mature form of the virus, nothing that you would find extremely exciting. And they're pretty small viruses. They normally have genomes of about 10,000 base pairs. And they have three genes. So if you're an RNA tumor virus, you can get away with just three genes to make more offspring. So they're pretty simple. One gene is called the GAG gene, and that stands for the group-specific antigens, and it really just codes for the internal protein. Another gene is called the envelope gene, and that codes for the envelope glycoprotein. There are usually more than one envelope glycoprotein. In fact, there are also many more internal proteins than one. So the initial primary translation product of these is cut up a large polyprotein is cut up by a protease into the mature protein. And the polymerase, our third gene here, contains the enzyme or the gene for the enzyme for that protease. So this is a virus-encoded protease that is used to cleave the initial internal proteins to their mature form. So you get one primary translation product from the GAG one primary translation product from the pole, and then this protease cuts it, cuts it up. Now, in the case of the envelope glycoprotein, that also has to be cut up because there's only one primary translation product here. That goes via the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's actually cut up by a Golgi body, host-provided protease. But these proteases, this protease function here is absolutely essential to get the single translation product of the pol and the gag gene into the mature form in the virus. And therefore, if we hit it, this specific protease encoded by the uh, virus <coughs> is a good target, and it is the target, indeed, of the protease inhibitors that we'll be talking about later on in the week. So the pol gene, this third gene here, contains the enzyme genes, reverse transcriptase, also a ribonuclease H activity, the integrase, and the protease. Now, the RNA in the genome, there are two copies of it. <clears throat> it's a diploid virus. It's two copies are not complementary. There are two positive scents. That's the same sense as the messenger RNA. Two positive sense RNAs there. 
capped and polydenylated, you might expect that. This is being produced by the host cell messenger RNA manufacturing system, using RNA polymerase too. So you might expect the RNA to look rather like a messenger RNA, and that's exactly the case. Now, the virus is a positive sense. The virus genome is positive sense. But unfortunately, it's covered in protein in the virus, in the nuclear capsid. And as a result, even though it is message sense, it can't be read as messenger RNA once it goes into the cell. So that means that new messenger RNA has to be made when the virus infects the cell. However, to make new messenger RNA, you've got to go through the DNA form, right? You copy the DNA using reverse transcriptase into DNA, uh, the RNA using reverse transcriptase into DNA, and then you use polymerase 2 to make more messenger RNA. So this copying of the positive sense messenger of genomic RNA into messenger RNA requires the DNA form. The DNA form requires reverse transcriptase. Reverse transcriptase is not in the cell because it's not a normal cell function. It has to be provided by the virus. But viral proteins can't be made unless you have the action of reverse transcriptase. Therefore, the virus has to do something. It has to bring molecules of reverse transcriptase into the cell with it so that it can copy that RNA into DNA. The DNA can be copied to RNA, and then the RNA can be translated into more reverse transcriptase and more other proteins. So each particle of a retrovirus will contain up to about 10 reverse transcriptase molecules, protein molecules, to get the thing going once it infects a cell. And here's a diagram of the virus. Although there's only three genes, clearly a lot more proteins, the primary translation products are, um, in, are cut up and inserted at their correct place in the virus. This, in fact, is HIV. So which... RNA tumor viruses cause human cancers. Actually, we don't know of many that do. There are two groups of retroviruses that are important. There's actually three groups of retroviruses, but one of them we don't really bother to think about. Uh, there are two groups of important retroviruses, the oncovirony, and these do cause human neoplasms, and the lentivirony, which until the 1980s was considered to be primarily in uh, a problem in veterinary studies because the archetypal virus was Visna, which is a virus that infects sheep. These have a long latent period. They cause a chronic progressive disease, and that Visna is a chronic progressive disease of sheep. But in the 1980s, HIV, a member of the lentiviruses, was discovered, and so now this has become obviously very important for humans. So which retroviruses cause uh, human cancers. There are really only two that are known to do this. In the 1980s, there was a big search for the human cancer retroviruses by a lot of people who um, thought that there were going to be a lot of them that were discovered, and there was a big race to find the first human cancer-causing retrovirus, but as I said, only two. They, are, they both involve neoplasms of lymphocytes, First one to be discovered was human T-cell lymphotropic virus 1, HTLV-1. It causes some not all that common uh, lymphomas. Uh, one, it's adult T-cell uh, leukemia, Cesare T-cell leukemia. They're the same thing. Cesare was the French physician who discovered this disease. It's got a weird distribution throughout the world. Um, Africa, the Caribbean, some Japanese islands, and particularly in certain parts of northern northwestern South America. It was originally thought that maybe it was the Japanese colonizers or the people who moved from Japan into South America brought the disease with them. However, there's now been the suggestion that uh, um, evidence that this disease was actually found in people before the Japanese people uh, moved to South America. But anyway, it's an odd uh, distribution around the world, but this cesare T-cell leukemia is caused by uh, HTLV-1, and about 1% to 4% of infected people go down with this problem. It also causes a disease called tropical spastic paraparesis, and that involves a myelopathy of the gray and white matter of the spinal cord, and again, about 4 or so percent of people infected by HTLV will go down with that. Um, second one, 
HDLV2, it causes hairy cell leukemia. This is found in Native American populations primarily in this country, in people like Navajo and Seminole Indians, and it's also found in Native American populations in Central and South America. Very high seroprevalence, particularly uh, women over 50. Up to half of women over 50 are in, uh, show sero, um, antibodies against HTLV2. And the reason it's called hairy cell uh, leukemia is because the cells have all these little projections all over them, and so they look rather hairy. And there's always the possibility, as we shall see next time, that HIV, HIV might be a third retrovirus that can cause cancer. Now, we know that the neoplasms associated with HIV-infected patients, things like um, Castleman's disease, Kaposi's sarcoma, are not caused by the HIV virus itself. HIV is a cofactor. The immune suppression caused by the HIV is what leads to the emergence of things like human herpes virus 8. But nevertheless, HIV is a retrovirus and has all the capacities, as we shall see, to cause cancers. And that's been a great problem for the development of anti-HIV vaccines. Because if we develop an anti-HIV vaccine that is an attenuated vaccine, we may be substituting a virus that can cause um, immune deficiency with a virus that can cause cancer. So there's been a lot of re reluctance to think about vaccines against HIV, as we'll see again later on, um, in regard to attenuated vaccines because of the possibility that HIV may also be a cancer-causing retrovirus. So let's look a little bit at their life history. They bind to a surface receptor. They usually bind to very specific recept uh, receptors. Uh, HIV binds, as you know, to the CD4 antigen on T4 lymphocytes. In many cases, endocytosis follows. The, in some cases, such as HIV, the virus membrane can actually fuse with the cell surface membrane, leading to syncytial formation. But either way, endocytosis or fusion of the plasma membrane, you get the nuclear capsid into the cytoplasm. And on that nuclear capsid, there are targeting signals which will take the nuclear capsid over to the nucleus. And it is there that reverse transcriptase starts to produce this form of the virus that can integrate into the host cell chromosome. So here's the parental RNA in the virus. Reverse transcriptase comes along and forms a hybrid. That ribonuclease H activity of reverse transcriptase now gets rid of the RNA here. And you get reverse transcriptase now acting as a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, forming a double-stranded DNA. That circularizes. The virus encoded integrase inserts it into the chromosome. The host DNA polymerase copies that as the cell chromosomes are copied. So the virus gets perpetuated in the chromosomes. And that's a major problem with long-lived cells which are HIV infected, as again we'll see later on. That DNA is now a gene. It gets transcribed by the host RNA polymerase 2 into the genome. Host splicing enzymes make messenger RNA and protein is formed. Now there's a big drawback to this. If you were designing yourself to be a virus, this kind of virus, you wouldn't do this because there is a major problem for a retrovirus in pursuing this kind of lifestyle of taking a genomic RNA, copying it into a DNA copy, and then copying that DNA copy back to messenger RNA. That is done by reverse transcriptase, as I've told you several times. That is done by the host RNA polymerase too. The problem is another problem of using host polymerase too. I've told you one problem for the lifestyle of retroviruses in using this host cell enzyme, polymerase 2, that is, it doesn't have a proofreading capacity. And so as a result of that, you get enormous mutations rates, enormous mutation rates in retroviruses. And that, of course, is a problem for vaccines. But there's another problem in using an enzyme that was designed to copy DNA in a gene into a messenger RNA. 
when Pol2, mRNA, RNA polymerase 2, copies a gene, it doesn't copy the whole gene. It doesn't need to. There are parts of a gene that have n- nothing to do with the information that will get transcribed into messenger RNA and translated into protein. There are parts of a gene which are designed or used to control that process, but the information is not perpetuated into the messenger RNA and translated into protein. These are things like the enhancers and the promoters and the initiation site and the termination site. All those are part of a regular gene, but they don't turn up in the messenger RNA because to make a protein, they're not needed. So here again is the problem faced if you use this kind of lifestyle. Here's your RNA, genomic RNA, coming in to the infected cell, and you've got an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, and all DNA polymerase need primers, and in the case of the retrovirus, that's a transfer RNA that the virus picked up in the previous cell that it infected. So it always carries along with it a few of the old host cells transfer RNAs to use as its primer. And then the reverse transcriptase copies that. Okay, we've now got a strand of DNA. Reverse transcriptase now copies that back, as we've seen, to form double-stranded DNA. Now what happens? You've got an RNA initiation site that is never at the end of the DNA in the gene. Upstream from here, you've got the promoters. So RNA polymerase 2 comes along, and it says, here's the gene. Okay, I'll land on a promoter there and I'll scan around, and I'll find the downstream initiation site, and I'll set up shop there, and I'll copy it till I find the termination site, which is ahead of all those enhancers and other control regions that are downstream. And as a result, we copy a shorter form of the gene. So, problem. The virus needs, when it forms its DNA form, needs to have those control sequences in, but they're not in the RNA, which came from a previously infected cell and was made by RNA polymerase 2. How does the virus overcome this problem of not being able to copy the upstream sequences, the promoters, the enhancers, the initiation sites, polyase sites, termination sites, and all those other good things that are parts of all genes but are never copied into messenger RNA? So, maybe the virus could integrate itself somewhere in the chromosome so that it was downstream from an RNA initiation site, it was downstream uh, from uh, some enhancers, etc., downstream from from promoters, upstream from enhancers, etc. That would be a pretty tall order to do, to get in there, but on the other hand, it might be possible. Alternatively, the virus could carry in its RNA form those promoters, enhancers, and all the other good stuff that a gene needs, but then it's, as said, not copied. Well, the clue to how it does it, and it's absolutely, I mean, it's amazing how the virus does this. They almost think that these things think for themselves. The clue to how this happens, which is also very important to the biology of tumor formation, comes from a subtle difference, or maybe not so subtle difference, in the structure of the RNA and the DNA form. So let's just look at the structure of the RNA form here. Here are the three genes, GAG, POL, and N, that I told you about. It's all that's necessary to make a new retrovirus. Upstream, there are some regions that are not used to make viral protein. There are two repeat regions, one here and one here, at either end. They're repeat regions. They're quite common in virus biologies, you've heard. And then there's two unique regions here. There's a thing called the U5 here near the 5' end. And here near the 3' end, there's a region called the U3 region. So these are the repeats here. And then before you get to the first protein coding gene, you've got a U5 region. And here, after the envelope gene, you've got the U3 region. And on the DNA form, there's a difference. You've got what are called long terminal repeats. 
And here, what you can see has happened is that this U3 region here has appeared here as well. And this U5 region has appeared over here as well. So now we've got U3, RU5, U3, RU5 called long terminal repeats in the DNA form. And that's not something we see in the RNA form. And this is what's happened. During the copying by reverse transcriptase, by an increasingly well understood but still not completely understood mechanism that involves circularization of the virus, etc. During the copying of the RNA form, that U3 region gets duplicated and put over here. And then you get the copying of the regular part of the viral RNA, and then that U5 region gets copied and put over there to form these long terminal repeats. Now, it so happens that there was an RNA initiation site and some promoters in this U3 region, not where there ought to be, but it's just been carried along here. And when that has been put over here, the um, U3 site gets put over to here, and it turns out that over here, there is an RNA initiation site when it's in the DNA form. And so we've got an RNA initiation site there. In the region up here, we've got a termination site, and we've got enhancers. Also in this site, there are promoters. And so we get an RNA termination site right here. So the virus has got cassettes of information for promoters and all the other things actually inside the RNA form that then during reverse transcription get put into the right place so that you've got a promoter here. Polymerase 2 can find that promoter, move along to the RNA initiation site there, copy the RNA into a DNA into an RNA form, terminating here, and you've got back to what you started with. Now, doesn't that, isn't that just absolutely fantastic? What would stop it from stopping it in the first place? That is a very good question, to which we do have an answer. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a termination site, as you say, here that, uh, in the U5. that gets transposed over here. That U5 there should contain the same termination site, and it does. But just in the beginning of the gag protein here is a sequence which causes the um, RNA to, uh, or the DNA, to be, uh, to assume a secondary co confirmation that actually suppresses the first of those um, termination sites. So, yes, the RNA should be started out here and should go down there to the termination site there, but it doesn't. It's actually read through in most cases because of a suppression sequence which is actually in the first gene, the beginning of the first gene. Uh, it's a puzzle that a lot of people have asked about. So this means that retroviruses then, if they're carrying their promoters in that little cassette in the, internally in the RNA form, can only have one promoter. It's um, in the U3 that gets shoved over here. So that means there can only be one RNA read off the gene. Okay? Because there's only one promoter site here, one RNA initiation site that was created in the DNA form at the right place. So only one long RNA can be made from the DNA form. Therefore, you've got to process that RNA, and for that you are going to usurp the RNA processing enzymes in the nucleus of your host cell, the host enzymes. And this explains why the RNA must be positive strand. Because the RNA has to function both as a genome in its full-sized form, and also as a messenger RNA, either in its full-sized form or in a spliced form. Now, in fact, what happens is that genomic RNA, which will be processed, uh, which will be packaged rather into the new viral particles, also acts as a messenger RNA for gag and pole. Host cell splicing of that messenger RNA cuts out the gag and pole, gives you the end gene, and then that is translated into the envelope glycoprotein. And I see the time now has come round to 12:50, uh, so or 11:50 rather. So it's lunchtime. I wish you a good lunch and I'll see you at a horribly early time tomorrow morning. <laughs>